Hey guys, it's Summer Rain from Homestead, Brooklyn, and I'm in Louisville, Texas. It's just outside the Dallas airport. So I'm contending with two things, allergies and also airplanes flying overhead. So I do apologize for all the sound, but you're going to have an amazing episode because I'm here with Steve Rosenbaum from Steve's Leaves, which is one of my favorite growers because he grows the things that he loves, which means a lot of unique and interesting varieties. And one of his specialties is begonias. And I know I've had a lot of questions about begonias and there's so many different cultivars, so many different varieties, and yet they're not always easy for people to keep in their homes. So Steve is gonna give us a few tips. So let's get inside. <laughs> It's very clear though that you specialize in begonias here. Give me an, a rough assessment of how many different kinds or varieties or hybrids that you might hear, have here at Steve's Leaves. We have hundreds, we have several hundred. It's a little hard to count when we have so many hybrids, uh, many or unnamed hybrids. Are there some overarching care tips for certain groups of begonias that you could give some of our watchers. I would like to uh, mention though before we get into that that if you know how many begonias you have then you don't have enough obviously. <laughs> yeah so there are uh, some man-made categories of begonias such as trailing scandent which are ones that will tumble over the edge of a container. There are rhizomatous, we grow a lot of those. There are rexes, and of course there's been hybrids between the different categories as well, so that kind of blurs the lines somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, cane and shrub type begonias. Probably what people think of the most uh, begonia-wise are the ones that are used as bedding plants. Mm -hmm. Some people call them wax begonias or more properly uh, Semperflorin begonias. So do you have any of those here? So this would be an example of one that would be considered a Semperflorin, even though it's not the common ones that people plant in their yard, but I hope at some point it will become more common. It is similar to a uh, well-known begonia called uh, dragon wing. And this is uh, very similar to dragon wing, but it has uh, pink flowers instead of red and it has variegated foliage. And this is one that we developed here and then didn't have a name for it though. So we had a naming contest of the employees and it was decided to name it after my mother. But I showed it to my mother and said, we wanted to name this after you. And she immediately said, how about Sweet Nellie? Oh her wow, name's so Nellie. her name's Nellie. So she named it really oh, wow. because, uh, and it's like, okay, that's it. So it's, it, this is Begonia Sweet Nelly. Now this uh, does like very bright light, so it would be good for landscaping or very high light indoors. It will grow in lower light, but it will be a little more spindly, but the main thing is it will lose its variegation. So e say, even you know, in here, if we have hanging baskets uh, shading them, they'll start losing their variegation. They really want very bright light. Would this work in like a south facing window or? Yes, okay. yes, I would give it a south facing window and the plant will tell you it, it has its own built in light meter and that if it starts losing its yellow, you know that it could use more light. And then what about watering for this one? I would water any of the begonias uh, the same way and really any of the plants we have here. Often the plant books say the number one problem people have is overwatering their plants. If they would just let the soil surface dry, maybe three quarters of an inch, inch or so down, let the soil surface dry, then water thoroughly. So some people will go, well, I keep my plants uh, evenly moist. And yes, that can work, but it's always a slippery slope mm -hmm. from evenly moist to constantly wet and mm -hmm. the plants drowning, the roots are rotting and you've lost the plant. There's another advantage to letting the soil surface dry. And it's also more, you know, in nature, it's not usually constantly wet. So the, it's a little more natural for the plants, but also uh, people sometimes have problems with fungus gnats or shore flies flying around the surface of their uh, pots and you'll disrupt the life cycle of those pests if you let the soil surface dry because they need it constantly moist for their various uh, life stages. I'm wondering now, you showcased this one, the Sweet Nelly. What other different varieties that we have here? And this needs high light, so yes. what about some of these guys here? Because they look like they're kind of in their own tribe. So these others uh, like bright light as well, but not as they don't need as high of light as uh, Sweet Nelly. So if you put these out in, in full sun outside, uh, there's more of a chance they would sc scorch. But indoors, you want a very bright, sunny window for them. One of the most showy groups of begonias are the uh, Rex 
One of the biggest challenges I've seen people have with them is the edge of the leaves turning brown, and that's usually a sign of, of uh, lack of humidity. So if you cluster your plants together, that increases the humidity in the area. Some people like to take a tray of pebbles and put water, but do not have the bottom of the pot sitting in that water so it, it, so it doesn't soak it up, but uh, the pebbles have a lot of surface area that uh, as the water evaporates increases the humidity around them. Some people like to mist their plants. I'm not a big plant mister. I don't think you get enough advantage from that. Probably the most common thing is the humidity on the rexes. Uh, so some of the other options you could go to a ry rhizomatous, and these are rhizomatous as well, but they have, they've been hybridized with at some point with a rex, but a lot of times they have these bright metallic colors. The uh, ones that don't have rex blood in them, so to speak, um, are often easier to grow. And we have lots of examples around here of a rhizomatous that are not also a rex. If you still have problems with the uh, humidity, lack of humidity and the brown edges, uh, the canes are usually a, a, a better option. It, it can still happen, but it's less likely to happen with the canes and shrubs. Another very popular uh, category are the what people call angel wing. A lot of people in begonia circles don't like the term angel wing. They don't like wax begonias for the semperflorens either. I try not to be that much of a plant snob, but uh, normally they're canes or shrubs, usually uh, either one, especially the canes, fall in that category. Now, this one was named for a, someone who works for me named Don Miller, who's uh, very famous in begonia circles. So this is begonia Don Miller, and you see it kind of grows these uh, canes. And then the shrub begonias uh, do a more branching like a shrub. It's uh, snow-capped, that's another cane, and there's just so many. Actually, in selecting these, mostly it was a matter of picking the ones that happened to be close to me because if I really went through, it, it would take me a while to, to gather up the plants I would want to talk about the most, but it's, it's really tough to choose. After you put water in and you have some of the salts and some of the fertilizer salts coming out at the bottom, I would imagine that you tend to release some of that those nutrients. So how often uh, do you fertilize your begonias, especially if you have them indoors, and what do you fertilize them with? Often in the emails we receive, that's one of the things that's like, oh, my plant was struggling and so I fertilized it. Usually that's the last thing it needs, that stresses it more. Or I, I pot, repotted it or whatever, let it adjust before you do all these things to it. But if it's actively growing, if it's getting kind of pale looking, washed out looking, then it may need some fertilizer. The fertilizer companies want you to use a lot of fertilizer. Uh, the plant may not feel need that much fertilizer, so I would go on the side of, of, of less is better. What are things to do to kind of improve the look of your begonias? Well, if it's getting lanky, you can pinch it back, which means, and actually I've had people say pinch, so they'll go up and they'll just pinch it like that. They don't realize that pinching when someone says pinching, they mean actually removing the tip. So yeah. you want to uh, remove the, uh, uh, the tip of the plant and that will encourage it to, to branch out. Now there are some things on begonias that uh, are a little uh, different and it makes it uh, frustrating to propagate these from cuttings because you have to be very careful where you cut it. So mm. you see that, and, and there are exceptions to everything. So not 100% of the begonias are like this, but many, many begonias, it, you have either flowering uh, stalk coming out of it or you have it uh, branching where you have vegetative growth like, mm -hmm. like right here. You have one or the other and not both. A lot of plants will do both. So if you cut that there, it's just gonna, it's not gonna produce another shoot out there. Somewhere down farther where, you know, maybe down near the soil line, it yeah. may branch there so you'll have a very ugly plant. You want to trim them back to where you have a vegetative shoot like this and then it will branch from there. And right behind the shoot. And, uh, well, in front of it. Where, yeah. where you would you cut it. In? You would cut it right there, right there. to get this okay. one to start growing. growing out. Okay. If if this one was was too tall for you and wanted to get to branch at that level, you would cut it off right there, and then have that uh, that would grow. But if you cut this one off, some people call it a blind shoot. Uh, once this fades, it will go away, and all you'll have is is just it'll just be cut there and never branch from here. It'll be somewhere farther down. And when the flowers die back. Um, do you deadhead them? Do you clip them off or do you just let them fall? If you have a, a whole bed of these outside, you're probably not going to have the time to go through and cut those off. And from a distance, it's not going to look bad. If, on a windowsill, you probably want to take it off because it's going to be viewed up close. 
Any other tips that you would have for our viewers on begonias? Absolutely. Well, how many hours do we have? <laughs> uh. Homestead Brooklyn is partnering with Steve's Leaves this week for a plant giveaway. So tune in tomorrow, November 3rd, for details on Facebook and Instagram at Homestead Brooklyn or on the homesteadbrooklyn.com newsletter. The link to both are below in the description. But in the meantime, you could check out Steve's Leaves at stevesleaves.com. Well, hopefully that was a very engaging session on begonia care, but tune in next week because we have begonia propagation with Steve's Leaves. And remember, if you love these episodes, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and you can follow along on homesteadbrooklyn.com and on Instagram at homesteadbrooklyn. Ciao.